understanding your brain and how your brain works and how that translates to your behaviors. If you can do that, you can manage literally anything in your life. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast. ADHD for smart ass women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 219 of ADHD for Smartass Women. I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyotsuka.com. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. In the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something, not one. So of course, I am just delighted to introduce you to Jamie Coutinho. Jamie Coutinho is a master of occupational therapy and the founder of Outsmart ADHD. She is the co-founder of Be Unemployable, which is an educational brand and podcast for entrepreneurs. Jamie is also an ADHD advocate, a coach, and a TEDx speaker. Jamie, did I get all that right? Welcome. You did. Uh, Thank you so much for having me, Tracy. I'm just so excited to be here. Well, I can tell this is going to be a real low energy podcast. Oh my gosh, just such a snooze fest. <laughs> so, you know, if you've ever listened to this podcast, yes. that what I always want to talk about is your story, your ADHD diagnoses first. So can you tell us what were the circumstances? So that's a really funny story, Tracy. So I was 26 in my last year of graduate school, or was it middle of graduate school? I graduated 27. So anyway, I was about a year off from from graduating from my occupational therapy degree. And I kept turning in rough drafts of projects. I had the final draft done and I was saving it. I was just saving every single draft and I guess not labeling it correctly because it turns out ADHD. And I was seeing the same therapist that I had been seeing since I was like 12 years old. And I went to her and I'm just like, I'm like, you know, I keep making these very like, like small, silly mistakes, even when I'm checking constantly. And I don't know, I've been doing some research on ADHD and I think I've got it. And she was like, you don't remember you were diagnosed as a child. I'm like, what? I had no idea I was diagnosed as a child. Um, I don't remember anyone having a conversation with me. I strongly suspected it because my mom was formally diagnosed. Um, when she got off of opiates, she actually had a brain scan done and um, found out that she had ADHD. And I'm like a carbon copy of who my mom was. So it made sense. But I didn't actually know I had ADHD up until a couple years ago. So that <laughs> that's how I found out that I had ADHD. Well, the thing about it, Jamie, is you laugh when you tell that story because it is a little humorous, mm-hmm. but I hear it all the time. I actually, the, oh God, I don't want to say the worst case I've ever heard because it's really not worst, right? It's mm-hmm. how our brains work. Right. Someone told me, and I can't remember if it was a podcast guest, it may have been one of my students, that um, they had been diagnosed three times and they didn't get it until the fourth. 
<gasps> that makes me feel a lot better because I have not heard that story yet. Like no one has told me yet that, oh, I was diagnosed and I didn't know it. So that actually yeah. makes me feel really good. <laughs> it's very common. And not just in instances where, you know, someone may have been diagnosed with ADHD as a child and the parents didn't tell them because mm -hmm. that can happen too, which is right. far worse as far as I'm concerned. Right. But then afterwards, you know, you, they're diagnosed a couple of times and, you know, they just don't remember it. So you threw something out there. So sorry, we're going to have to go back to the childhood when your mom got off of opiates. Yeah. Yep. So my mom was physically disabled. The 10 year anniversary of her passing was just here on February 18th. So she's been gone for, for 10 years now. But anyway, um, growing up, she was physically disabled, um, got injured at a factory job, and then surgery after surgery made her even worse. And she was raising me and my brother. Um, my dad it was a functioning alcoholic, but um, emotionally abusive, definitely mentally abusive. And she was raising pretty much my brother and I like a single parent. He, you know, made an income, but that was it. So she had to be able to function to raise us. And of course she was put on opiates for the chronic pain. Oh. And she actually spoke in my high school about, um, about drugs and stuff. And the way that she did, it was super not it was not like um, when they would put on those dare assemblies. Yeah, like Nancy she would Reagan just say no. Yeah, 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 no. She would be like, "Do you really want to be on opiates? Because when you're on opiates for a long time, you can't even take a crap because you're so constipated." Like she went into the nitty gritty of what, um, like what being mm -hmm. addicted was. But she was addicted for I think like eight years. Um, got off of opiates because it was just ruining her body. I mean, she. And her um, like respiratory system, I mean, everything was just sh shutting down. Um, so she got off of opiates. She did a, a rapid detox, which was still under, um, it was still experimental at the time. So it was like, I don't know, like 20 grand out of pocket that my family paid for her to get off of opiates. But she did a brain scan and found out that she had ADHD, which of course, all of us smart ass women have probably researched that there's a there's a lot of people who have ADHD and end up um, becoming addicts in some way, shape, or form because of that you know that dopamine that we're craving. But anyway, um, yeah, that's that's how I found out that I have ADHD. <laughs> so um, you were in therapy then for was it trauma? I was in therapy for anxiety and depression, um, starting at like 12 years old, mental illness runs on, I would assume both sides of my family, my, my father's side, they're all, they're pretty much all like addicts, alcoholics and things like that. Um, and I would strongly suspect that they have mental illness and that's how they're dealing with it. Yeah. But yeah, I have a lot of mental illness on both sides of my family. So what happened? Um, it's a year before you're graduating from high school. Your mom, who was your sole support, because it sounds mm -hmm. like, did you have a relationship with your father at that point or no? So at 16, my mom, she was like the strongest person I've ever known. She was making $800 a month on social security, but he, she had enough of it. Um, there was one altercation and she said, I'm done. I'm never leaving or I'm never coming back. And we didn't. Uh, she and I left the house. It was the day before my junior year of high school. And we went over and lived at my, I've got an older brother that's 15 years older. He had a one bedroom, one bathroom house. And he and his two kids and a pregnant girlfriend were already living there. And we went and stayed there as well. So we stayed there. Um, and then the next year we were able to get our own little place. It was maybe like 500 square feet. The closet is where my mom pretty much like there was this, there was this room that didn't have any vents in it. So there was no heat or, or air in there, but, um, we opened it up, you know, had a fan in there to try to blow like heat in, in cool air into it. And that was her bedroom. Where were you living then? It was a very small house. No, um, no, no. What, oh, what like city or state? Oh, in Michigan, a very small town. Oh my town gosh. So in it was Michigan. freezing. Yes, her room was really her room was really cold. Um, but she let me have the only bedroom that was in the house, and then she was in that spare room. Oh. 
Um, like the rooms weren't big enough to have closets in them. Like I shoved all my stuff under my bed. My mom, I have a really cool video of right before we moved out of that house, we took a video. It's like my most prized tangible thing I have in the world. And we're doing a tour of the house before we move out because my mom actually somehow, I don't know how, but got a loan and we were able to move into what we thought was going to be her forever home. But she passed away two months later. So uh, year one, we're living with my brother. I mean, there was, I mean, my brother, his two kids, uh, pregnant girlfriend, then me and my mom. So there was six of us. And she had a baby during that time, by the way. Um, And then um, from there, we were able to get this like 500 square foot house that was near the school that I went to. And we were there for about a year. And then my mom, uh, we moved into the home we thought was going to be our home forever on my birthday, December 2nd. And we were only there for two months because she passed away on February 18th. Um, so no, I didn't have a relationship with my dad. Um, since, since he was abusive, um, I chose to not live with him because it just, it wasn't going to be good. My best friend at the time actually came and lived with me in my last three months of high school. And somehow I still graduated with honors and, I I won't forget. um, So my mom passed away on a Friday and I took like the entire uh, next week to, of course, you know, plan a funeral. And then I was supposed to be back at school the next uh, Monday, like literally a week from when she passed. And I woke up and I'm just like, I just can't, I just can't do it today. And I didn't have a parent to call in for me. It was a really weird moment. Like I called in for myself and the school just knew that like, I'm taking care of myself. <laughs> it was a, it was really um really a hard time. <sighs> okay, so then what happened? So, um the second that I graduated, Wait, there's a question I have to ask cuz it's oh. just stuck in the back of my mind. You yeah. know when it worms and then I can't focus on what you're yep. saying next. Yep. I do. So, did your disabled mom work? In order to, like, I'm trying to figure out, okay, you, you bought this house. Like, how, if she's disabled, how did she work? She didn't. Um, I don't know how she got the loan. She had really good credit. Luckily, I've got some aunts that were very helpful. We had some friends that would help us, like, get by month to month. She, <laughs> But was the loan, was the payment on the loan cheaper or at least the same as if she would have rented? probably, probably mm-hmm. cheaper, the same. Um, I think that the, the loan payment is not high. It's like four something because yeah. at the time she got the house for like $60,000. I mean, this was okay. back in 2013. Um, I'm so thinking it was, of California, right? So I'm like, oh, how did this happen? Yeah. Yeah. No, we were, I mean, small town, Michigan, uh, middle of nowhere. She got the house for $60,000. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is heartbreaking. Okay. So, so you need to start telling us something good. So what happened then after that, you decide I'm going to college. Yeah. Um, my mom, since she got injured, um, on the job at a factory, she said, use your head, not your back. You're going to like, you're going to college. That was beaten to my head from a young age. She was like, you're never going to depend on a man. You're going to college. Like you're going to be able to support yourself. Like she pounded that into my head since I was a little girl. Your Um, mom sounds amazing. She was absolutely incredible. So I did go to college. I didn't know that I had ADHD. Um, So there's nothing wrong with the ADHD brain. But when you don't know how to use the amazing ADHD brain you have, it's really hard. (laughs) So I struggle. I struggled socially. I struggled. Well, and um, you have no support, Jamie. So it was like a a double, triple whammy, right? Yeah, (laughs) it was really rough. Um, I, I actually moved to Arizona and lived with my aunt for that first year. She was a godsend. And... I'm so appreciative of her. She had never Is had your kids. mom's sister. Yep, my mom's sister. Okay. Um, so I lived with her for a year. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for her. I started going to a community college. It was, of course, really hard because, like, I'm 18. I just lost my mom, and now I'm living across the country. I don't have friends, but I also moved across the country because I was scared of my dad just being able to show up at my doorstep anywhere. And since I didn't have my mom in Michigan, um, I've always been like a nomad at heart. I wanted to travel. So it made sense that I would just start new somewhere else. And I wish I could say that life got really great then, but it, it was mm-hmm. really, really hard. A um, couple of years later, I moved back to Michigan and I uh, finished my, um, my bachelor's degree 
in in Michigan, but three and a half hours away from where I grew up. Um, and that was also really hard because when you don't have uh, financial support and I didn't have a lot of emotional support either, mm-hmm. um, like really, really broke, like can like considered dancing at gentlemen's clubs, maxed out my credit card, um, mm-hmm. couldn't keep had a hard time keeping jobs because I couldn't emotionally regulate. I didn't know that I was overstimulated all the time. Um, Well, and on top of that, you had all this trauma, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, oh my gosh. And by yourself, like, was your brother in your life at all? Your older brother? So my older brother, yes, he also has ADHD. So it's funny, we're close, but we don't talk very much because, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So every so often we'll, we'll give each other a call. But his girlfriend is actually the first person I would always call if something went wrong. It, it's funny because she's like, if there's, she's like a handy, a handy woman. So if there's anything wrong with my car or anything that went wrong, like she's the one that helped me to apply for college, to apply for housing. When I was living on my own as a senior in high school, like she helped me to affl- apply for, um, for government assistance for like food. Like she has been a godsend. Um, she's been my, like my right hand woman when it came to figuring out how to adult since my mom wasn't there anymore. Oh yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So you graduated from college and then what did you finally get a job? So you had some at least financial stability. So I, I did get a job. Um, of course I went from Michigan all the way to Florida as an admissions counselor. I got a job while I was there on spring break and I was there with my now husband and one of my best friends just for spring break. And I kept saying, you know what, I'm just going to get a job and stay here. And I'm always talking out of my butt. So it's not anything new, but I meant it. So um, I was visiting some of my cousins and my one cousin worked at a university as an admissions counselor. I think she was an associate director. And while we were in a different part of Florida, you know, doing touristy things, I came back to Fort Myers, her area. And she was like, Hey, you've got an interview on Friday um, to be an admissions counselor. I'm like, what? (laughs) So um, did the interview, got the, got the job soon after, and then moved to Florida. And then from Florida, came back to Michigan because my husband, who I was roommates with in college, decided finally that I was the person for him. And I'm like, listen, no one's getting in the way of my education. I'm going to be an occupational therapist. So here's the deal. You're going to either help me in that journey or else I'm going to stay my happy ass right here in Florida. I'm going to keep working at this school and then do my occupational therapy degree here. You have those options though, because there's not just me coming back to Michigan and then not like supporting that goal. No, thank you. So he was like, yeah, I'm going to support that dream of yours. So he did. Why occupational therapy? So I originally wanted to be an occupational therapist because I saw all of the struggles my mom had physically. Mm -hmm. Like I went into OT school thinking I'm going to help people with their chronic pain. That was always my goal. And it's so funny that now I help people with ADHD. But yeah, that was always my goal. It was my mom. She passed away because the um, the hospital overdosed her on a fentanyl patch. It was malpractice. There was oh a, my gosh, yeah, there was a lawsuit um, that we won. And unfortunately, since she wasn't working at the time, um, or since her her early twenties, um, the amount that we could sue for was actually very low because she wasn't deemed like a very important member of society. It's very it's really screwed up. Um, so I've got a mountain of student debt. It didn't even pay for all my schooling, but that's how she passed away. And I had it in my brain. I'm like, I'm going to help people holistically. I don't want anyone else to feel this pain. I don't want anyone else to lose a family member because of something like this. The patch, it was too high of a dose and it also malfunctioned. So all of the medicine went into her immediately. Wow. I was actually in New York City with my best friend at the time on a vacation when I got the call that she had passed away. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry, Jamie. Um, (sighs) Thank you. (laughs) It does sound though that, well, I always say our best purposes give meaning to our past. And so it makes sense that you would um, be interested in occupational therapy. And I, you know, I didn't even really know what occupational therapy was until I had uh, the brilliant Vanessa Gorkin on our podcast. I think we've had her on twice. Oh, that's awesome. And when she started talking about exactly what it is, Mm -hmm. it just made so much sense for the ADHD brain, right? Yes. Because 
you're meeting them where they are and mm-hmm. then figuring out how can we build action around this? Like, what can we actually do? Yes. I knew what physical therapy was, but I couldn't mm-hmm. understand the occupational therapy. Like, okay, so how is it different? So I'm curious. So you did that for how long? And then why did you decide to get out of it? So occupational therapy, I never actually worked as a traditional occupational therapist. I did what probably would make most parents cry and that I went to school for 10 years and then decided I didn't want to work in the traditional medical system. Mm -hmm. Um, So Mm -hmm. I actually started my business while I was still in school. Sounds very ADHD, Jane. Absolutely. (laughs) You're speaking to someone, yeah, who went through law school, practiced for five years and then said, "Mm, nah. Right, right. Exactly. (laughs) Okay. So I'm curious, what turned everything around for you? Was it getting that ADHD diagnosis? And did you say that happened at 26? Yeah. And that was the turning point for me when I understood that, okay, this is because of ADHD. It's not because I'm a flawed, terrible human. I was able to work with my brain. So then I did a deep dive into research. I learned everything I possibly could. I joined every freaking Facebook page possible for women with ADHD. I looked at the patterns and then having the occupational therapy background, understanding the brain and seeing how it affects the behaviors. And it's like, oh, well, this is happening because of executive functioning. Oh, this is happening because I'm chasing dopamine. I get it now. And then figuring out workarounds, finding what other people have done for workarounds, creating my own workarounds, and then realizing that the people-pleasing tendencies that a lot of us ADHDers have oftentimes comes from trauma that we've experienced in our childhood and just wanting to get that love and validation as an adult. And then when you can't say no to other people, you're not able to get any of your done, um, which makes, you know, so on having understanding all of that, but yes, it was first and foremost, understanding that I had ADHD game changer, absolute freaking game changer. And so that is what changed everything in terms of what was it that you stopped beating yourself up? Yeah, I, I pretty much realized that there wasn't something terribly wrong with me in it. And I, I say that, but it's not like it was, oh, yay, I'm, there's nothing wrong with me. Like, it has been a journey to accept that this is my brain. Um, but now that I accepted it, I've more than accepted it. Um, I'm very open about like, oh, are you a neurotypical? You only think of one thing at a time and you want to talk about the weather. That's so nice. So like, it would, <laughs> you poor thing. Um, so um, I I talk, I celebrate my brain and I also celebrate the the brains of the women in my community too, and and to remind them that there's absolutely nothing wrong with their brain. We just have a different blueprint that we live by. And honestly, it's more fun. Absolutely. So then somewhere in all of this, I think this was fairly recent, you decide that you need to do a TED talk. (laughs) How did that go? Oh, are you ready for this, Tracy? So typically when you do a TED Talk, the process is that you go on like the TEDx website, you find different talks, you look at the events that are, you know, local to you, go on to their specific page, do an application. If you get through the application, there's several other, are there several like interviews? And then if you're one of the lucky ones, you get picked. But me, I'm impulsive and I have ADHD. So what did I do? I contacted the or the um the coordinators directly through email. If their email wasn't on the on the TEDx website, then guess what? I'm going to their personal website. I'm finding their their email there. I'm finding them on social media. I'm going to message them there. I mean, I was ruthless. I was so laser focused. And I don't know how many I pitched. If it was like 10, if there was more than 10, I honestly just can't remember. And the pitch that I sent them It's not something that you would find in any type of business course. It was not like it was the I think the 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 subject was something like, do you want to make like my wildest dreams come true or whatever it was? No, I think the subject was like your most grateful TEDx applicant. And then like the first line was like, are you ready to make my dream come true? I want to be a speaker because, you know, and I had these re- like my, my why, but then it was, I had a section. I was like, have you ever done traditional public speaking? And I said, no, 
but I did do the high school play both years, junior and senior year, and I did amazing. Also, my mom's eulogy that I did, I made people laugh and cry, and I was also great there. And then my third point was that I don't have an Instagram. How many people under 30 can say that they don't have an Instagram? Like anything that I could do to make myself stand out, I put it in that email. It's totally lacking social norms or a pulse on like any type of etiquette. And I even put a picture of myself in there like, hey, this is who I am um, so that you can get a better idea of who I am. And I think it was a picture of me in like a rainbow sweater with like waving high. It was like one of my branding pictures, I think. I mean, just off the freaking wall. But I got it. I got an email months later after I wasn't even thinking about um, the TED Talks anymore because it turns out that when you send emails like that, you don't get a lot of replies. But I did get one. You only needed one. I only needed one. I got one reply. I got an interview. Um, I originally got the talk. And then they told me that since I wasn't based out of Ohio, that I couldn't do it. But I didn't take no as an answer, Tracy, because I have ADHD and I am one determined B. So what I did, what I did was um, they're like, oh, man, I'm like, they need people from Ohio. They want to promote people from Ohio. Ohio. Perfect. Because my business partner lives in Ohio and our, our my other separate business is actually out of Ohio. So I sent so much. I'm like, Maggie, you got to give me uh like, give me proof that, that I'm tied to Ohio. So she sent like articles that she had been published in. Um, I sent a podcast talking about where we're from and like that we're from Ohio or that she's from Ohio, like anything I could, it was pretty much her social proof that I was using to justify why I should be at that Ted talk. So I sent everything that I possibly could in like four separate emails, because as I got more, I was just sending it. I wasn't even waiting to collectively send it. And luckily the person I was talking to was neurodivergent too. So he didn't think I was an absolute whack job. So then they had a meeting. They're like, yep, you'll get it. You're in, um, cried tears of joy. And like, uh, four weeks later I had the talk. It was, it was about a month later that I had the talk and had to prepare for it pretty quick. How did it go? I think it went pretty well. Um, and it's so funny because there was one part during it. I only had t- uh, two slides total because I knew that I wouldn't remember to click the slide. So I only had to remember to click it once. Well, it turns out I forgot to click it that one time. So when I was like, when I was like a minute past when I was supposed to click it, I was like, oh, wait. I'm like, it turns out I have ADHD and I forgot to click the slide. Here you go. And I clicked it. Um, and then I just kept talking which is very ADHD and on brand. And I'm happy that they didn't edit that part out because it just is my reality every day. But exactly. It, no, yeah. I, okay. So I'm, I'm going to tell you, I saw it and I thought it was adorable. Oh, thank um, you. The first thing I thought though, is how did she do that? She must have no working memory problems. Oh gosh. I wish that was the case. <laughs> You remembered everything. I did. I did a lot of practicing. I um, there's this really amazing book, and it's free on Audible. And um, oh my gosh, I have to I have to find it for any public speakers out there. But it really did a good job preparing me for the talk. It talked about like how to structure it. Oh, long story short, by Margot Leitman. Um, get it on Audible. It's free amazing book to help you to prepare of how to do a talk. It it goes over everything. And I did that process. And um, even during my run through with my speaker coach, because when you get a TEDx talk, they give you a speaker speaking coach. Mm -hmm. And there were parts that I forgot during my run through and I'm like, crap. So I did a little bit more practicing over the next day or so. But I remembered almost every single part. There was one small part that I forgot. And it was talking about how um, we struggle talking to neurotypical people because our understanding of of social norms is sometimes skewed. We can talk about something that we love for a long, long time and not realize they're getting bored. But that was the only part that I missed and everything else I got. So I was really happy with it. I think Ted, uh, the, the whole Ted whatever organization. That's the word that I wanted. Mm -hmm. Ted organization needs to make TED Talks more, you know, user-friendly to uh, those of us without working memory. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. I think that, I mean, I I have spoken before and 
you know, done speeches. And I remember one time I literally got out on the stage and I could not remember why I was even there, like what I was going to talk about. I had to go back in the wings. It was weird. It was like a runway, you know, where a plane uh-huh. was taking off yep. and I just kind of skidded and stopped. I mm-hmm. had to go back out. They had to play the music again. And then when I came out, it all kind of fired. But I, I'm honestly I'm, not even a little surprised, Tracy. <laughs> like that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the working memory issues. If I have bullet points, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. But if there's just even a little bit of anxiety, that's when I struggle. And you give me a teleprompter and I'm friggin' amazing. So. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so that I understand sense. that you were also cast in a reality show about entrepreneurship. Is that true? <gasps> I was. Yeah, I got done filming um, a little over a week ago. Um, it's called The Blocks, B L O X. And um, the host of the show is. Wes Bergman, he's actually been on uh, MTV reality shows for the last 20 years, and he hosted the show. And there was over 60,000 people that applied, and I was one of them. And the reason I got got that as well is because I took a similar approach that I did to the TED Talk. I did all of the interview, pro- like all four steps of the interview, but I didn't want that to be the only thing that I gave them. Like, you know what? I'm going to give them even more of a reason to to want me on their show. So after the third step, I sent them a video. I'm just like, listen, I know that you already have like my answers, but these are more reasons why you want me on your show. And then after the fourth step, the fourth step was talking directly to the casting director. And at that point you had a 50, 50 chance of getting on the show. And, um, The person, uh, Maddie, she's amazing. And she also has ADHD. So we had a great time on the conversation. Um, But I, even after that step, I created a YouTube video that was 10 reasons why you want me on your show, five reasons for the entertainment aspect of it, and five reasons as an entrepreneur. And I sent them to them that as well. And my last reason was that I have two dogs that finally have a fenced in yard and they're already telling me that they want a bigger yard. And in order for that to happen, I need to to do amazing in my business to get them an even bigger yard. So Wes, I know that you've got a little doodle. So you're an animal lover. Please do this, not just for me, but for Newton and Bruno as well. And I literally... Yep. And I literally sent that to uh, to him, the casting director and the other um, person that was helping him with the casting process and then found out about a week later that I was cast for it. So what was the show about? So it's it was a competition for startup entrepreneurs. You could make you could either be at the idea stage of your business all the way through to making 2 million annually in revenue. So you're competing with, I mean, well-established uh, entrepreneurs as well. And um, he gave a curriculum during that week, but he gamified it so that it was fun to learn and also so that um, he could make it a show and teach other people because his two passions were well, like reality TV. He had been on for the last 20 years and then also entrepreneurship. He has an amazing um, company in. Kansas City that it's an investment company, but also like they build, they build websites, they do, they do everything. But, um, so he merged those two passions and created this reality show for entrepreneurs and gave us an incredible education during it. Wow. So this was super fun to do. Oh my gosh. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. It was so funny because the casting director, she told me, she was like, you know, it's going to be long days. Like we're, we're going to be working like long days. Are you okay with that? I'm like, listen, I've got ADHD. I was built for this shit. I'm like, I can hyper-focus all day long. This is going to be the best thing ever. Okay. So Jamie, you Mm -hmm. need to talk to us about fear. So I'm sure there are people listening our Mm -hmm. listeners, our wonderful listeners. And they're thinking, oh my gosh, I could never do that. That sounds so scary. Mm -hmm. So I am assuming that there was some fear for you, but talk to us. So my why is showing women with ADHD that they are brilliant. And if I allowed my fear to get in the way of that, I wouldn't be able to help anybody. And that's what I've had to remind myself every single step of the process. It's like, oh yeah, sure. I can uh, curl up in a corner, but am I going to be able to help anyone if I do that? Am I really going to be able to fulfill that purpose? So that in and of itself, um, the thought of not being able to help women with ADHD is more painful than being rejected. I can be rejected all day long. That's fine. I actually 
you have to tell me no at least three times for me to even consider listening to your no. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that in and of itself. And honestly, it's never as scary as you think it's going to be. Yeah. I did um, an open mic night one time for stand up comedy. Oh, gosh. Yep. Yep. And um, I signed up and I didn't have anything prepared. And the day before I found out that they let me be one of the people um, for that show because there's like, I don't know, 60 people that want to be on that night. And um, they only pick like maybe 10. Well, I was one of them probably because it was my first time ever signing up for it. They want newbies. So I crammed that night, figured out a five minute set or four minutes. I think they only gave me four minutes and did it the next day. There was a whopping like five people in the audience total, including my husband. It was dead that day. I'm telling these jokes to, I mean, like literally five, mate, and there might have only been like four. I remember my husband, there was these two girls and luckily one of them would laugh at everything. Thank goodness. And then there was this- Probably drunk. Probably, but she, I'm like, I'm so grateful for you, girl. I should have bought her a drink. And then there was this old man sitting up in the front, but that was like it. And um, obviously, if I would have absolutely bombed, nobody would have been laughing the entire time. And you have to make somebody laugh. And there's like five people in the audience. So it's going to feel like crap. And I didn't do amazing. I didn't do terrible. But it wasn't nearly as scary as I thought it was going to be. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? You bomb? Oh, freaking well. Try again. Okay, two comments. So the first mm-hmm. thing I want to make sure that our listeners hear is that you are not focused on yourself. And that is what makes it so much easier. You're focused on ADHD women and how you can change their life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's number one, that when we focus on ourselves, yes, it is so scary. But when we can focus on something or someone outside of ourselves, it's, it's a hell of a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And then the second, uh, this is more of a question that I wanted to say is, or ask is, um, so I'm curious, what is your husband's reaction in all of this when, oh my God, there she goes again. (laughs) So my husband, imagine a very level headed software engineer, quiet, logical. (laughs) I figured. Yep. Um, total opposite of me. And it's funny because we've been together now for six years and I have become maybe a little a smidge more logical. I don't even know if I can really say that. I definitely work with my brain better. So I look like I'm more organized. I am more organized than I used to be, but he's definitely a little bit more adventurous than he used to be, but he's my rock in all of this, but he's also my number one cheerleader. So when I was, um, building this business. And also when I started building my business, we were living with his parents because he had a a mental health nervous breakdown. We had to move from Missouri all the way back to Michigan to live with his parents. So in the midst of more chaos, I created this business, but he believed in me since day one. When I told him what I wanted to do, he said, do it, go for it. Like we invested in a a lot of money in, in business coaching that first year way, 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 way more than I actually made. But he's always believed in me. Always. Even when it looks like I was never going to turn any type of a profit. Like he has always believed in me. So his reaction has always been like die of embarrassment a little bit, especially when I'm doing things like the open mic night. But then also he's got his foam finger with my name on it too, because um, yeah. You chose right. You got a good one. I did. So why do you think that so many ADHD women choose entrepreneurship? I mean, we know it's not Mm -hmm. cut out for everyone. I Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think, oh, I've got ADHD. I need to run out and go start my own business. No, that's not what we're saying. But there's a lot of us, right, that are really Mm -hmm. attracted to it. Why is that? And we're good at it. And we're good at it. Um, So I think that we lean towards entrepreneurship because, for one, the corporate world doesn't really for the most part, um, celebrate the needs that neurodivergent people have. Like we have different sensory needs. We, we require a specific environment to be able to focus. Sometimes that means there's music. Sometimes it means it's very quiet, depending on the person, depending on what they need to do. Sometimes our energy levels fluctuate day to day. We can have a plan that we're going to get all these things done, wake up and be exhausted. But then the day after that, we're going to be working for 14 hours straight, hyper-focusing on something and getting three weeks of three weeks of work done in a day. So I think that entrepreneurship allows that flexibility, which 
For me personally, um, the thought of working in an office again and working nine to five and also the the small talk. Oh my gosh, we all know it's Tuesday. We all know the weather. That in itself. Oh my gosh. Um the last job I worked at, I I didn't really respond to the the small talk over what do they call it? The oh, Microsoft what? Teams. Oh. And um I realized really well, not not super quick, but I realized eventually that they're not feeling like I'm part of the team because I'm not chattering and stuff. So I would just send my random funny gifts and I'm like, all right, well, there's my contribution for the day. But I think all of that um, makes us lean more towards entrepreneurship. And also we have incredible ideas. And as long as we have the tools to make that incredible idea a business and um we have the hyper focus. We have the impulsivity that allows us to get over ourselves and actually try the thing and fail. I think that that all helps us to be incredible entrepreneurs. I love that. And um, every day brings something new, right? When you're running your own business. So it's really hard to get bored. It's really hard to get bored. And it's so funny because my um, business partner, Separate Venture, Maggie, she talks about how like, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, especially in the early days, it's like there's fire everywhere. And we work really well in chaos. Like it's just, if you, if you are considering being a business owner, just ask yourself like, do I work really well in chaos? And if the answer is yes, then that's, that's one good thing for it. You also have to be okay with working your butt off and not making anything for the first while. So if you can do both of those things and also somehow get over your fear of rejection, whether that be in therapy, through coaching or whatnot, you're you're good. You'll figure it out because us ADHD women, we will focus until we find the solution. That's what makes us, I think, incredible entrepreneurs. Yeah. Tenacious. If we're interested, right? Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. If you're going to start a business, do it on something you're really passionate about or else it's going to just be another hobby. Yes, exactly. And we have many of those. So mm -hmm. what do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD is? I think it's understanding your brain. I think it's understanding your brain and how your brain works and how that translates to your behaviors. If you can do that, you can manage literally anything in your life. I agree. What is your number one ADHD workaround? Do you have one? I do. Um, so pairing a task that you freaking hate with one that you love at the same time. So the 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 BS neurotypical advice is, okay, well, just like do the boring thing and then reward yourself after. Um, excuse me, I am dopamine deprived and no thank you. Executive dysfunction. Um, I'm not doing anything unless there's a reward during it. So when I'm doing, yeah, when I'm doing something boring, um, I will be listening to a podcast. If it's something monotonous, like uh, doing the dishes, I, I personally hate doing the dishes. So I always use that as an excuse. I will have a podcast on while I'm doing the dishes. You will not catch me doing housework without listening to a podcast or an audio book. Um, so that's my number one workaround is pairing something that you love with something that has to get done, but is boring or not fun. That is a great one. So thank you for that. So Jamie, are you working on something that you want to tell us about? Well, I am currently working on a lot of things because it turns out that I have ADHD. So depending on when you <laughs> listen to this, go to my website, outsmartadhd.co, not com.co. Um, I've got um, a community where we do body doubling, um, which has virtual support. And then I also do ADHD coaching. I'm working on a membership as well. Depending on when you listen to it, maybe the, this, maybe it'll be out. <laughs> well, this will all be in the show notes. So when they click on it, it'll all be accurate to what you're actually doing at that particular time. Perfect. Jamie, you're a delight. Thank you so much for bringing all your energy and spending time with us here today. Thank you, Tracy. This has been probably my most fun podcast so far. Don't tell the other hosts, even though this is public, but you're simply a delight. And thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Jamie, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smartass Women. Come join me over at tracyotsuka.com. 
Thank you so much, and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.